from Russia to Sasha. This was our very first concrete clue, leading us to Pichushkin. We established his address at once. At the same time, the investigators uncover the video from the security cameras at the metro station. That we were dealing with a serial killer. With seven bodies discovered by police and a serial killer on the loose, Moscow becomes a city in fear. Investigative journalist Yana Zhakinskaya is immediately drawn to the case and begins to cover the story for the Russian and British press. We realized that it's a serial killer, it's a maniac operating in, in Bitsa Park. We called him Bitsa Maniac. People were frightened and Bitsa Park is a very popular place for recreation. But the people were scared to go there because they, they, there was a feeling of danger. Despite discovering so many bodies, police have few clues to the identity of the Bitsa Maniac. The killer didn't leave any trace. We tried to pick up different objects from the crime scene, but our analysis didn't show any trace. No fingerprints, nothing. He operated very, very carefully. The investigators need all the help they can get. They turn to the one man who can assist them. Professor Vladimir Warontsov is one of Moscow's most senior and experienced forensic examiners. He's been inspecting murder victims in the Russian capital for nearly 40 years. It falls to him to determine the exact nature of the victim's gruesome deaths. All the injuries were inflicted in the head area, and there were very many of them. The most massive injuries would be made on the back and side of the head and on the face. It was like a calling card for this criminal, his signature. These are the skulls of some of the victims found in Bitsa Park, and they have suffered massive injuries. Although the forensic evidence is very limited, Professor Warontsov is still able to determine the likely murder weapon. This fracture was made by an object with an angled edge. It could have been a hammer. But just who is the killer wielding the hammer in Bitsa Park? Within weeks, there's a sensational development which promises to unlock the whole mystery. By January 2006, Moscow police have seven unsolved murders on their hands, all battered with a hammer in Bitsa Park in southern Moscow. All with the same telltale injury, the neck of a vodka bottle embedded in the gaping wound at the back of the head. And for senior investigator Andrei Suprenenko, there's virtually no evidence to go on. Whether the killer was a man, a woman or child, nobody knew anything. Whether he lived in the area or used to live there, whether he knew the park well, nobody knew anything. With little concrete information to go on, rumors and theories abound. But one place close by attracts the special attention of the investigators. Could the killer be right under their noses? There is a psychiatric sanatorium on the edge, on the edge of Bitsa Park. Some of the stable patients would be allowed to go for a walk to Bitsa Park. They would have a day release. And there was this theory that the killer could be the patient of this sanatorium who escaped and was hiding in Bitsa Park and killing people. A considerable number of people were checked. Anyone who was a bit suspicious was stopped and questioned by police. But without a prime suspect, the psychiatric patient theory goes nowhere. But then there was another more compelling line of inquiry. 
the victims were mainly men and middle-aged. They were really people nobody cared about and nobody would be looking for. We thought since it was only men who were the victims from the very beginning, that it might be a woman. No one knew the real motives to the crimes. We were looking at various possibilities. 200 Moscow police stake out Bitsa Park. Their task is to stop and question anybody suspicious. But the park is vast. Covering an area of 22 square kilometers, their chances of catching the killer red-handed are remote. When the transvestite was detained, naturally it was suspicious. And then the police make a startling discovery. The transvestite is carrying a hammer in his bag. That guy felt like the right guy. But the transvestite claims he only has the hammer to protect himself against attack. When the story gets out, the press has a field day. We thought that this was the right guy and there were lots of papers with the headlines, the Bitsomaniac is caught. But the transvestite has a convincing alibi. We suspected he wasn't the killer by the end of the first day. But to check his alibi required almost 24 hours detailed work. And only after it was all done was he released. A week later, 25-year-old supermarket worker Mahmoud Zhaldashov is murdered. With each newly discovered body, the coverage in the media was getting more and more intense, and police and prosecution chiefs were pushing us to find and detain the killer as soon as possible. The pressure on the murder squad is becoming intense. They're struggling to keep on top of the growing body count, which now stands at 12. Additional investigators like Elena Pognazina are brought onto the case. We had to have a team ready for when new events hit us, new murders happened. Then there is a significant development. At some point, and there's a reason which wasn't clear for us, he switched to killing women. In April 2006, investigators find the body of 48-year-old supermarket worker Larisa Koligina. Two months later, they find a 14th victim. In June 2006, another body was discovered. A body of a woman with the same kind of wounds typical ones, like all the others before, so we knew we had another case to be investigated. Then investigators make a crucial discovery, a metro ticket in the murdered woman's coat. Investigators now begin an intensive trawl of the surveillance footage of the Moscow metro to see if they can find out who traveled with the woman that day. But it's an enormous task. Then there is a further breakthrough. Two days later, police officers called me with a message that the son of the murdered woman had turned up and identified the body. The victim was 36 year old single mother, Marina Moskolyova. She lived alone with her son, Sergei. When we interviewed him, he said his mom had gone out for a walk with a boyfriend, Sasha. She didn't come home. 
As investigators piece together Marina's last known movements, her son delivers a key piece of evidence. Before she left, Marina had tried to call her son on her mobile to tell him where she was going, but it wasn't working. She left a note saying where she was going and who with. She left his name and phone number. The phone number was registered to a 32-year-old supermarket worker, Alexander Pichushkin. The name Alexander is often shortened in Russia to Sasha. This was our very first concrete clue, leading us to Pichushkin. We established his address at once. At the same time, the investigators uncover the video from the security cameras at the metro station. While scoming through the videos, we found Moskalova with a stranger walking together inside the metro station. These are the last images of Marina Moskalova alive. She doesn't know it, but she's walking with a man who has a hammer in his bag and who fully intends to kill her. That man is Alexander Pichushkin. The video confirmed it was really him, together with Moskalova, which was the proof we needed to arrest him and accuse him of the murder of Marina Moskalova. On the 16th of June, we arrested Pichushkin. It was in the evening. It was dark. 10, 11 p.m. He was absolutely calm and denied everything at the beginning. At the point he was detained, he was only suspected of Moskalova's murder. But with the evidence mounting up against him, the note left by the murdered woman and the video images of her last moments alive, the investigators are sure they have the right man. And Pichushkin soon realizes it himself. They usually confess. Everybody confesses eventually. I didn't have any doubts. Investigator Pomerzina is right. Within a few hours, Alexander Pichushkin confesses to the murder of Marina Moskalyova. After eight months.